Hello, and welcome back to a special episode of Stock to Brock. <laughs> Why is it special? We didn't really plan on it. We received so many comments from our episode three throttle restriction that we thought we should jump in and as quickly as we can address some of those comments. Before I get started, I need to make something clear that I probably should have touched on a little bit more in episode three. Our modifications from here on out, these are competition use only modifications. So what does that mean? If I flash my ECU to anything other than stock and Suzuki, any other brand, doesn't matter. If I flash it and blow up my bike, <laughs> if I take that bike with a flashed ECU into my dealer and say, hey, warranty my bike, they're gonna laugh at me. Doesn't work that way. These guys are smart. Keep that in mind. We're going to take this bike directly from the dyno to the racetrack, and we're going to go as fast as we possibly can. If we screw it up, it's on us. So if you're worried about your warranty, please keep that in mind. Um, exhaust systems. If you live in California, you must have an EPA-approved exhaust on your bike if you're going to operate it on the street. Um, here at Brock's Performance, we don't offer EPA approved exhaust. So we don't even ship to California. We're not going to send it there. So what we're doing really doesn't apply to you. So uh, now we're going to go ahead and address the comments from episode three right now and uh, check it out. The number one question we received about the throttle restriction episode, hands down, was why? <laughs> Brock, why would they do this? Why would Suzuki restrict their latest, greatest treasure that they've put out on the market? Well, uh, that's pretty simple. There's several reasons, but uh, primarily you're looking at emissions and noise management. And what we showed you with the throttle restrictions, it, it doesn't stop there. They actually restrict the, uh, there's a butterfly in the exhaust, we'll show you here in a moment, that that also turns off. Now, I don't want to get myself in trouble here. They market these as torque producing um, valves, uh, X up valves. And I'm not going to say they don't produce torque. I'm not going to go through all the work of, of trying them with, trying them without. They, they might produce torque, but they also, when you close off your exhaust system, it makes less noise. They're smart. These guys are really smart. Um, so, but if, from an emission standpoint, um, we've had to deal with the Euro 3 standards, which came into effect in 2007. We've been dealing with them for quite some time, and usually they had like secondary throttle plates uh, there. They, we just took them out. <laughs> they can't disrupt our performance if they're not there. Well, these bikes, the throttle by wire bikes, they only have one set of plates. So you can't just chuck them. <laughs> the bike won't run. So we have, we've gone to having to change them in the ECU. So um, now they've progressed. So the 2017 Gixxer fell under Euro 4 standards. Once again, well beyond the realm of our conversation. You can Google this stuff if you want to know more details. But this bike falls under Euro 4. So it's, it's dealing with considerably uh, stricter emissions um, regulations than previous bikes so that's why we're getting this level of, uh, of restriction on this particular motorcycle now add to that california emissions because you don't have separate versions now for california and the rest of the u.s everybody gets this one thanks california um and also u.s epa and then add to the fact that euro 5 emissions are looming for 2020 and I, they, there's no two-year um, change anymore for sport bikes. They don't, they don't make a new one every two years. So this one's going to have to pass Euro 5 also. So that gives you an idea just how important passing those regulations are. So what's that mean for us? Welcome to the dino pit. So what does this mean for us? Well, if you look at the 2017 Gixxer exhaust, this is pretty big, and you heard the dyno runs. It's also very quiet. Uh, we also have some pretty robust tubing here that's heavy. So uh, what I did, if you could pan over here for a minute, 
We took a Ninja H2 exhaust, and I'm most definitely not getting on the designers. These guys have a tough job considering the, um, you know, the red tape and bureaucracy they have to go to. These exhausts work very well for the, the, uh, what they're engineered to do. Um, let's look here. This is the CAT. Catalytic converter, CAT as we affectionately know it. And you can see me put my hand on this. It looks like this exhaust swallowed a fairly decent sized box turtle. So if we come over here to the uh, to the muffler, and this thing is this thing is stout. It has uh, it's it's most definitely heavy. And but between this componentry and we don't have all the shields and stuff here, this is almost 40 pounds of metal that we're talking about hanging off the Ninja H2. Like I said, works great uh, for what it's designed to do. Um, this little component here, if I can get you to pan in here, see this little plate. I'm going to turn this valve open, close. Only takes 90 degrees of movement. Close, open. So, what is that valve? <laughs> that is your exo valve or Exhaust Ultimate Power Valve. Another one of those crazy acronyms. I can't make it up. Can we get a little bling? <laughs> we first started seeing these from Yamaha in around, I don't know, 2007 or so. And um, uh, most of the manufacturers have, have adopted them now in, in some form or another on most bikes. Uh, if we can get you to come over here, Suzuki has their uh, Suzuki Exhaust Tuning version so uh, it turns so uh, what actuates the uh, Suzuki exhaust tuning valve well there's some cables that go up here back to the tail section to this little deal and what runs that little actuator deal you guessed it the ECU the ECU controls a lot of this stuff these days so uh, what we're gonna do we're gonna show you more details on the exhaust tuning here in episode 4 but right now, we're going to go back to our Q&A. All right. No tinfoil hat. You can look this one up on Wiki. So, there is also an unofficial gentleman's agreement. When the uh, 1999 Hayabusa came out, it was fast. It was crazy fast. Stupid fast. Um, one of my favorite motorcycles still to this day. The problem is, the uh, Europeans folks in charge over there apparently thought it was too fast and they had plans to just put speed limits on everything <laughs> they saw they saw chaos coming I guess over there on the Autobahn and stuff because the bike was just it was yeah it was fast so in order to keep um, the government our government everyone's government out of our business um, the big four Suzuki Kawasaki Honda Yamaha they said, well, why don't we just all agree amongst ourselves to put self-imposed speed limit of 300 kilometers per hour, which is 186 miles per hour, on our bikes so that they don't have to mess with that. I mean, there's, I guess some of these supercars do that. So it made sense. And so now, uh, and also from my understanding, which I couldn't find on Wiki, um, that limit is also... 200 horsepower um, measured at the crank, which you would get on your MSO. We'll talk about that here in a second. So, um, anyway, so uh, as you know, technology progressed, um, Ducati jumped in, um, MV Agusta, uh, the Italians, <laughs> apparently, they jumped in and said, no, it's our job to make our bikes as fast as possible. So they just, they blew past that. Uh, with one of their bikes and uh, of course uh, BMW jumped in with the S1000RR and they're all keeping it keeping it relatively sane but the uh, this this bike here in particular uh, it's not going 200 with setup like it is and I'll show you on RMSO that it says 185 horsepower so anyway that's what they're doing. They are uh, they are self-imposing and they're and they're sticking to it, you know, with this motorcycle. So they're being honest about it. So if you look at our MSO here, the horsepower listed on our 2017 GSXR 1000L7 
is 185.3 SAE, which is <laughs> telling me that this bike is so restricted it can't even make their 200 horsepower limit. Now, if we go up here to the calculator, we made 165 SAE. Now, we take into consideration an, a, about an 11% fudge factor for drivetrain loss on a rear wheel dyno. So if we take that 165, multiply it by 1.11, 11%, 183 horsepower SAE. So we're almost right on what this title says this bike should be making. So uh, you can't really argue with what's going on here when it comes to the horsepower. Another frequent question was, is my fill in the blank restricted also? Well, if your bike was manufactured after 2007, whether it's a 600, 750, 1000, even a Harley Davidson, because the, uh, the air-cooled bikes have problems passing emissions also it most likely is so um, it's just not quite the same way if you take a look here what I've got is a set of GSXR 1000 throttle bodies and so back in way back in the old days the throttle was controlled by the rider the cable went straight here to the uh, we call these the primary throttle blades and then on the back were the secondary throttle blades which are controlled by this servo. And what's interesting there is, you know, if the throttle, if the operator says, hey, I'm at wide open throttle, the servo, also controlled by the ECU, can say, hold on there, cowboy. We're just gonna slow you down a little bit, or as much as we want. So that's how those bikes were restricted. So come over here to modern day, we've got a set of uh, BMW S1000RR throttle bodies, and they're very similar to our new GSXR. Oh, where's my rider? That's right, throttle by wire. It's all controlled by the little um, rheostat we were talking about. And this is very similar to the setup we had. Primary injectors, secondary injectors. So we're getting a little mental picture of what happened there. Well, on these, if we didn't want the bike to be restricted, we would just unscrew the secondary throttle plates, throw them in the garbage. That way they couldn't affect uh, what was going on. Now when you did that, you, of course you had to have mapping because if you just all of a sudden let all that additional air in there, you'd have to match the amount of air to the amount of throttle. So we mapped them, typically with a power commander, and we're done. Well you can see, if, if we remove these blades, there's nothing to control the amount of air going into these bikes. So uh, you can't do that now. They have to be mapped via the ECU. So let me come up here real quick and show you what's going on since this is a BMW. This is a data log from one of our BMWs at a land speed event. So just for clarity, the red line is the throttle. This is our rider, Zach Milholland. He was at wide open throttle. This solid black line, first gear, second gear, see the saw two, that represents, this our RPM, that represents acceleration. Second gear, third gear, fourth gear, fifth gear. Now look at sixth gear. It just stays flat. It doesn't keep accelerating. This bike was speed restricted and it had a pipe, it, had, it was mapped, it had MR12. This bike made, you know, uh, right around 200 horsepower. It was stuck at 194 miles an hour, and there wasn't anything we could do about it except de-restrict it. So, at the racetrack, look at this black line, uh, the uh, dotted line here. First gear, second gear, third gear, fourth gear, fifth gear. We get into six, and now watch it climb. Now, it's in sixth gear. You're in sixth gear for a long time, about 10 seconds at, on, the, on the, that, uh, that kind of event but it breaks 200 miles an hour. What did we do? On this bike, we were able to just grind, <laughs> grind one of the lugs off of the Speedo pickup and trick the bike. The Speedo never saw 186 miles an hour, so it didn't know the difference. It just kept accelerating. Um, this was back in 2010. So anyway, just goes to show, you can trick the ECU. We do it in the, uh, we can do it in the ECU sort of primitively like that, or we can flash them. If you have the wheel, the wheel sensors, you can't just grind the speedo lug off. So keep that in mind. And now we're gonna go to our final restriction on these motorcycles. The final question I wanted to address was, we had some people saying, well, 
maybe Suzuki was closing the throttle blades prematurely so that the bike will have a longer engine life. You know, could be a valid point, but I want to point something out. This is the ETV chart from a completely stock American model. In the 100% throttle column, we showed you in the last video how it's shutting the throttle blades off early. Well, here's the same chart from the European model. And you can see the 100% throttle column, it allows the throttle blades to open all the way to the red line. Now, <laughs> let me ask you some questions here. First of all, why do the Euro Europeans who came up with the Euro 4, how come their bike's not restricted like ours? I, I really don't know. Is it California? Is it EPA? Is it pending Euro 5? I can't answer that question. All I can tell you is ours is restricted more than ours or more than theirs. And if you see videos from the Europeans dyno testing their bikes, they're making more power than ours. About 10 to 15, depends on the dyno um, and the conditions. So this makes sense to what they're seeing. I can't answer the why. Um, and quite frankly, I don't care. I'm gonna just get rid of these restrictions and make our bikes run correctly. Um, so I thought that might interest you also. So all of this brings me to our attitude here at Brock's Performance. Now, I'm not trying to sound like a commercial. I just want to let you know where we're coming from. Um, we believe it's our job to try to understand what the OEMs, what their, what their restraints are, their constraints, I guess, um, when it comes to building a motorcycle. You know, what do they have to deal with? You know, Euro 4, EPA, noise, all of these regulations, all this red tape that they have to put on an otherwise race bike. These, these, are, these are thoroughbreds here. These are wonderful machines. So if we can measure what's going on, understand what I'm sure their engineers would love to do. And, and you know, a great example is Kawasaki's H2R versus the H2. The H2R is a thoroughbred race bike. It's, that, that thing's awesome. Um, but what would Suzuki do if they just didn't have to deal with all this? You know, That's what we try to understand. We try to embrace that, and we try to develop components to work with the heart of the beast. And we try our best to do that. So um, we're just giving you a, a, a look, a glimpse into our, our mindset when we build packages and components that go into these bikes. So I hope you're enjoying this. We're having a lot of fun. I'm glad you get to go along for the ride. So we're going to get into episode four, part one, because exhaust can get complicated and enjoyable.